Welcome to Daybreak Australia. I'm Heidi Stroudwatts in Sydney, where markets have just come online. And I'm Paul Allen. We are counting down to Asia's major trading opens. The top stories this hour. Big tech drags Wall Street away from all-time highs as investors await NVIDIA's earnings. Traders also starting to speculate whether the Fed's next move is a hike, not a cut. Australia's earnings season continues with Rio Tinto and Woolworths among more than 70 companies reporting this week. Plus, the US said to warn allies that Russia could deploy a nuclear weapon into space as early as this year. All right, let's take a look at what's happening on the markets. We have, of course, just open for trade here in Australia. Early going, of course, we have a staggered open here. Uh, so we're just off by about a quarter of 1%. Hard to get a read on things, of course, but we are going to be watching a lot of stocks today. Uh, Woolworths uh, was one of those out with earnings. The CEO, Brad Banducci, is going to retire. He did not have a great experience on local media this week. We might talk about that a bit later. Uh, Rio Tinto, one to watch as well, uh, impacted by falling iron ore prices. Santos was out with full-year prices. Profits also, and National Australia Bank had a trading update. But by virtue of the fact that all of those stocks are some way down the alphabet, they yeah. haven't started trading yet. Uh, we've got uh, not a great deal of movement on the Aussie 10 year. Yields have just been grinding lower a little bit. Not a lot of movement in the Aussie dollar as well, about 65 and a half cents US. Okay, let's see what we've got in terms of Nikkei futures. We are, of course, uh, keeping an eye on things because the Nikkei closing in on that all time high that it set in December 29, 19. 89. The number to watch for the close, 38,915. We're some way off that yet, and futures suggesting it's going to be a fairly quiet day, so we might not get there today either. A uh, little bit of weakness in the end, relatively speaking, just dipping below 150. Oil's an interesting story, some competing pressures there. There was, of course, tension in the Middle East and the OPEC plus curbs, but balanced against that, very weak demand out of China, Heidi. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned at the top just how much pressure there is when it comes to these numbers due out of NVIDIA. It's hard to underestimate just how much money and perhaps sentiment is really riding on these numbers, right? Options signaling almost $200 billion uh, uh, really in market value riding on that earnings report and prices for short-term calls implying that a 10% move in uh, those shares could potentially see quite a bit of volatility. But this is the picture as we take a look at US futures. As we mentioned, it was really big tech drop, drop, dropping uh, and dragging the uh, broader market a bit lower from that all-time high uh, on the back of really some of the, the nerves ahead of the NVIDIA numbers on Wednesday, really looking for confirmation that uh, there is really substance behind these AI boom expectations. NASDAQ futures settling a little bit lower at this point. Dow Jones futures also looking pretty flat uh, at the minute and there are of course still ongoing concerns about what some of the latest data and the Fed speak really means for the direction of the Fed going forward. I should mention a couple of names that we're also watching when it comes to some uh, reallocations within US markets. Amazon named to the Dow Industrials, uh, industrial average I should say. So we're seeing a bit of a pop there for Amazon in post market trading after it was uh, allocated to the Dow Jones Industrial Average. We also see some other names uh, being switched around as well. Uber replacing JetBlue uh, in the Dow Jones Transportation Average. We're also seeing Walgreens Boots Alliance will be exit, exiting, I should say, uh, that uh, average as well. So we've seen a bit of a, uh, a sell-off in Walgreens Boots in the overnight session. Let's uh, get some more views from our Chief Rates Correspondent for Asia and Live contributor Garfood Reynolds with us now. And and Garth, you know, so much of this uh, at this point in the week is riding on whether we get, I guess, you know, uh, reconfirmation in those NVIDIA numbers uh, that investors were on the right track by backing this AI boom. Yeah, that's right, Heidi. It's, it's somewhat concerning you would think even if nvidia's numbers do end up well that we're so reliant on on one company for the direction of uh you know the world's biggest stock market we're used to it being more about five or six companies uh but i you know it is seen as the poster child for ai and with rates high with concerns about the impact of that on various sectors of the economy and also with concerns about some parts of the global economy showing weakness you really need something like ai to change the game and therefore to drive sustainable gains for a market that you know is is close to unprecedented levels on a nominal basis and even on a valuations basis is is a, at among the higher levels we have seen you know, across history 
Yeah, and another wild card to throw into the mix here. I spoke to one guest yesterday who described U.S. markets as unsinkable, and now we've got uh, some commentary suggesting that maybe the Fed's not going to ease. We could see a hike. Uh, what's the logic behind this? Well, I mean, the logic behind that is that, you know, the Fed, I mean, Powell did actually say back when they were starting to push back against these early rate cut bets that, you know, we our base case is that we will be able to gradually ease rates later on this year, provided the data give us confidence that inflation is going to return to target in a timely fashion. And he, but he flagged that, you know, if the data doesn't give us that confidence, well, you know, we wouldn't rule out a hike as well. And the data have kind of been moving in that direction. We've had a reacceleration in inflation. We've got you know, pretty strong demand. We haven't really had the fall in consumer inflation expectations that the Fed would fully like to see. And in particular, the, that speculation about rate cuts, even after it's cooled off, has given us some pretty loose financial conditions. So uh, I think you would need to see another very strong jobs report and some more concerning inflation numbers before it would happen. But uh, you know, I'm sure that there's very few members of the FOMC that would be ruling it out. Uh, and you only need to look at as Powell and co have often done, look at what happened the last time inflation was this high. There, the Fed cut at the first sign of economic trouble and then ended up having to hike again. They've made it clear that this time around, they would prefer to hike uh, you know, hike too high and then have to cut when they're, you know, rapidly when they're fully sure, rather than have the risk of going down and then up. So if they've got a concern that you know the economy is too hot that gives them every reason to go higher all right bloomberg m live contributor garfield reynolds there well the u.s will unveil sanctions against russia this week following the death of opposition leader alexei navalny president biden blames his russian counterpart vladimir putin for the death of navalny who had been imprisoned in the arctic i told you we'd be announcing sanctions on russia We'll have a major package announced on Friday. Well, Bloomberg's editor Michael Heath joins us now. Michael, there's already a whole lot of sanctions in place against Russia. I can't imagine Vladimir Putin's quaking in his boots at the prospect of more. No, I mean, when, uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine and the anniversary, the two-year anniversary for that is on Monday, uh, there was a, a swathe of... of, um, of sanctions and measures against Russia, against um, senior officials there. And the expectation was it would really damage the economy there, that this was going to be quite, you know, this was some, one of, some of the biggest round of sanctions that we'd seen. And, uh, and there was a period of adjustment in Russia, but it really does look like they've managed to, to re retool and, and remobilise their economy where they can function um, under these sort of, sort of uh, issues. I mean, the only way that you can really target Russia that, that hits home is um, the senior officials. A lot of them have children abroad, a lot of them have money abroad, all this sort of thing. You, it's sort of, you really need to target that, um, but it's quite difficult to, to explain, to argue, you know, why are you targeting children, all these sort of things. They all like to have, uh, you know, while they like to be patriotic at home, they all like to have their children and, uh, going to Oxford and these sorts of things. So, um, but as to those sanctions themselves, I mean, Russia's still selling oil. At the end of the day, if Russia can sell oil, Russia can keep financing itself. And financing its space program, it seems, because this Bloomberg scoop is telling us that we could see sooner rather than later a nuclear weapon from Russia in space. Yeah, it's really concerning because um, in the past when people have sort of gamed out how would we end up in another serious war, you know, potentially World War Three or something, the, the, they sort of end up coming to this conclusion that it would be something generated from, from war starting in space. Um, and Russia doing this, I mean, un unfortunately, the more we see from Russia, it's just becoming more and more reckless internationally. And it's sort of, it's almost like this saber rattling to, to seek attention or something like that. And there's part of me that thinks it's almost, I mean, it's, it's not North Korea and it's not quite going down that path, but it looks for these pinch points where it can leverage and, and where it can cause trouble sort of thing. And, um, 
Yeah, it's just um, it, it's just really concerning. I mean, the, the the reason I bring up North Korea is I was just reading earlier um, earlier this week that large parts of Russia the heating isn't working. You know, they're relying on Soviet level heating for, for a very cold country, and yet they're talking about a nu uh, nuclear weapon in space. You know, the sort of the priorities are distorted there, um, which looks like you know these very autocratic regimes. So it's worrying, and and it's something that I think will concern um, not just the West but the world in general. Well, let's uh, switch focus to what's going on in the Middle East and particularly the war in Gaza, of course. Uh, a UN resolution calling for a ceasefire got struck down. What, what happened? Yeah, well, uh, Algeria put forward this um, this resolution for a ceasefire, and it's actually not not that different from what the U.S. apparently is sort of drawing up as well. But it, it calls for a, sort of an immediate end to the war. Um, also calls for the release of hostages and and um, for no attack on Rafa, obviously this this last area of um, of Gaza where a lot of civilians are obviously have have sought shelter um, and which is a, a real cause for concern. So the U.S. vetoed it. Britain abstained. Everyone else supported it. Now the U.S. says that. Um, that it did so not because it's necessarily opposed to it, but because they're trying to work, you know, uh, the Egyptians and, and uh, the Qataris uh, and the US are trying to come up with this uh, pause in fighting, not, not ending the war because Israel would reject that, but a pause to try to release the, the hostages. And it said that the, the UN resolution as it stood didn't help that case, it sort of hindered it. And the US is working on its own, which would again be a pause and uh, the hostages released. And, uh, and it, they are also uh, requiring that, you know, that Israel get the civilians out of harm's way before any events happen in Rafa. You know, diplomatic positioning on this conflict is one that you would expect the G20 foreign ministers would have at the top of their agenda. They're meeting in Brazil on Wednesday. But we're hearing that it could be so split and so sensitive that it gets removed entirely from the agenda, which makes people question the relevance of the G20. Well, it's ex yeah, it's exactly right. And it's the same with Ukraine, too. It's, it's quite unusual there. I mean, you can sort of see with, with Israel and, and Gaza the divide, you know, the natural one, the civilian casualties, all the suffering and that sort of thing. Um, with, with Ukraine, you'll find a lot of the global south is actually sympathetic towards Russia. And the idea that Russia is leading some sort of anti-imperialist bloc when it's invading a neighboring country is quite extraordinary. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, the G20 is there to solve problems, to have dialogue, to discuss these things. And when they get to a stage where they can't even put things on the agenda, um, I mean, really, it just leaves them with economics. And, and that's fine. But these geopolitical issues do impact the economy as well. So you can't just pretend they're not there. It, does, it really does raise questions about the, uh, its role going forward. Bloomberg editor Michael Heath there uh, with that chair political wrap of some of the headlines. Coming up though, we take a closer look at uh, the earnings season here in Australia. JP Morgan's head of Australia Equity Research will be along with us. Insights into those recent beats and misses and guidance next. This is Bloomberg. Uh, about 15 minutes into the start of cash trading here in Sydney. Take a look at some of the movers as we're early in the thick uh, of earnings season here in Australia. Big week uh, with almost 100 companies reporting uh, throughout the course of this week. One of them is Rio Tinto, of course, that we're waiting for a little bit later on today. We're off by about 2.3%. But in the meantime, a bit of news flow. Rio Tinto is signing Australia's biggest renewable power deal. Uh, so that could be sort of an extra narrative that we're watching as we get those numbers. Santos, uh, disappointing. The full year net income missing estimates and its numbers this morning. Uh, income coming in at $1.4 billion. Uh, that's down about 33% year on year with a final dividend per share of 17.5 uh, cents there. Also a little bit uh, more than expectations. We're also watching Woolworths. Big leadership change, of course, as Paul alluded to at the top. has been a, been a very difficult week for uh, the Woolworths CEO, Brad Banducci. He has tendered his resignation and uh, he will be replaced by Amanda Bardwell. The retailer has really been in the spotlight for much of the wrong reasons amidst the rising cost of living and inflationary pressures with its margin really kind of catching the spotlight when it comes to local media coverage here. Amanda Bardwell currently heads up the loyalty and e-commerce divisions at Woolworths. I'm watching NAB as well as uh, we continue to uh, really watch some of these uh, banking numbers with the first quarter unaudited cash profit coming in at 1.8 billion Aussie dollars. One of the few outperformers so far in what is a pretty cautious start to trading across Asia.
Uh, and as I mentioned, a big week when it comes to uh, reporting season here. Over 70 firms on the Australian Stock Exchange, the ASX 200, totally a market cap of $691 billion will be reporting this week. Let's get some analysis with JP Morgan, Head of Australian Equity Research, Jason Steed. And Jason, great to have you with us. It hasn't been a bad season so far. No, it hasn't, Heidi. I think we started uh, with really a bang last week and there were some fantastic results from a series of retailers, a number of companies. Since then, though, we've hit a couple of pockets of turbulence, so uh, the fast start is still a good start, mm. uh, but we have seen some signs in certain sectors of a bit of weakness and I'd probably point out communication services and a bit in the mining sector. But so far, I think it's confounding some of the very negative expectations that a few in the market had on the way in. The narrative is always very interesting for some of the stalwarts like financials, Aussie financials and banks, for example, right? And, uh, you know, to some extent, there's the argument that perhaps they don't get as much love as fundamentally they should. Where do you see the opportunities falling here? Well, certainly with the banks, uh, they perform tremendously well. Mm. Uh, and, and often the view from offshore is that Australian banks are too expensive, yep. can't invest in them, almost it's a better idea to short them. But it tends not to be the case. We have a, a consumer in Australia that is still well capitalised. Clearly, there are certain segments of the economy where there are pressures. But by and large, the consumer is well capitalised. We're seeing that mortgage cliff pass uh, without falling off it, which I think is, is really important in the context of the underlying picture. So financials have done well, but they are all trading at uh, quite full levels as a result of that. But if you look more broadly around the market, we see good earnings growth opportunities over time, say in healthcare. Uh, that's a sector that had a difficult 2023. But you look forward now and there are opportunities. That being said, for healthcare so far in the results season, it's been patchy. Mm. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's been the best season to this point, but really our view is looking out six to 12 months. Discretionary, I think, is where we focused a lot. It's not a huge sector in market cap terms in Australia, but it is a sector uh, that has displayed that resilience of consumer demand. Uh, it showed the quality of some of the companies in the sector. I think that really stood out. You're seeing margins better than expected. You're seeing management's able to manage what is a moderating price environment with really effective cost control. In terms of the financials, we, we obviously had the big news yesterday with ANZ getting the green light to take over Suncorp. Uh, consolidation in the space pretty unusual in Australia. Do you expect to see more of it? I think this is obviously a huge deal that took a long time to get through and, and it raises ANZ's uh, position in the mortgage market, gives them a greater share. Hard to see a lot more happening. We have seen in the past the regionals uh, and, and speculation regarding uh, the regional banks. Um, obviously you're seeing within certain parts of the financial sector outside of banks uh, yeah, attempts at consolidation and some consolidation happening. But I think when it comes to the big four, given the challenges that ANZ found uh, in in going through this process with Suncorp, hard to see more consolidation in that area. But as you move down the cap spectrum and out of the banks, uh, I think you know that's still an area where there might be the prospects of some consolidation. I just want to get back to your point on materials earlier. We're going to hear from Rio Tinto a bit later on, obviously really exposed to what's going on in iron ore, what's going on with China demand. Uh, what are your expectations for this space? So we, we've, we felt that the steel demand picture has been more robust, certainly, than expectations. So that, that's, that's put us in a, in, a, in a view around the miners that, certainly for the bulk names, uh, the picture is more positive than the generally downbeat view on China as a whole. Uh, but there have been some issues, certainly, for a number of them in terms of costs, low returning projects. Um, so it has been a difficult start to the year for the mining sector at large. Clearly, lithium is a different story altogether. Uh, but we do look at the large miners continuing strong cost control there still is this uh, value over volume mentality and discipline that does seem to be working uh, and most of them are trading at levels in our view that don't represent how strong free cash flow is in the context of where iron ore prices stand today so uh, we are still you know constructive, I guess, uh, around the sector, but understand that there still are a lot of concerns about where does the, you know, the economy in China go from here? Uh, does it sort of hold up as policy stimulus comes through, or is there this risk to the downside that you see um, you know, further weakness in housing that undermines the steel demand picture? Jason, I know you've covered uh, broader Asian markets at points in your career as well, and it's, it's interesting that Australia is always seen as a very domestic focused market, perhaps not as exciting. How do you compare uh, the value and opportunity within Australia to some of the market darlings at the moment, like Japan, Korea, India? Well, I think we have a 
uh, a market outlook here that if you're looking for income, clearly we have uh, a higher dividend yield than most markets. Um, that has always been a point of attraction for certain investors. What's interesting to us this year is nominal growth in Australia looks like it will be very strong uh, and it'll be stronger than a lot of developed markets and part of the emerging market which to us is a really important measure because that tends to drive underlying earnings growth uh, and for us therefore where you look at sectors that are in a resilient position in terms of their customer base in terms of their business model that are geared to the economy and this nominal growth outlook we see quite a positive picture um, in terms of Australia it would sit for us in a global context probably at neutral which is not that helpful um, but it's certainly not a market in the past which has been seen as more of a, uh, you know, an afterthought or often an underweight. And we tend to say to a lot of international investors who we speak to, Australia is probably too underweight in your portfolio. It, it is seen as that domestic market, as you point out, but we feel that it's probably underheld, certainly across certain sectors. So, you know, we think that uh, if you look at the long sweep of history in, in our economy, you're generally tending to get resilient economic outcomes, good nominal growth, and generally consistent earnings plus dividends. Uh, one of the themes we're looking at today is the narrative that perhaps central bank tightening isn't over. Um, possibly we might see one more from the Reserve Bank of Australia as well. Uh, it was a good year for the ASX last year despite all the tightening. Can, can that continue? Uh, it, where, where we sit in terms of valuation of the index, its, it's current levels are just above um, what our valuation is. And certainly what we're thinking of in the context of that valuation is some easing on the rate front. So uh, a rate increase would, would, would put a question mark over where we stand. Uh, and certainly the minutes you know, pointing to that have, have led us to sort of rethink, are we in a situation whereby inflation is a bit more sticky? Therefore, you might see a, another rate increase. But what we've seen so far in results season is earnings up upgrades uh, and clearly that's what feeds into our model that values the index as a whole so it probably offsets one another but I would say if the RBA is back with one or two more rate hikes which obviously would be a big surprise in the context of expectations a month or so ago then that does put a question mark over what we saw as last year's strong performance so I guess we wait to see it still feels to us as though the cuts coming but um, you know yesterday sort of put a question mark over that all right sure thing Jason Steed thanks so much for joining us Jason is head of Australian equity research at JP Morgan. And you can get a roundup of the stories you need to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. Terminal subscribers go to DayB Go. This is also available on mobile in the Bloomberg Anywhere app. And you can customize your settings so you're only getting news on the industries and the assets that you care about. This is Bloomberg. You're watching Daybreak Australia. Some of the corporate headlines we're tracking this hour. Citigroup raised CEO Jane Fraser's pay about 6% to $26 million in 2023. The bank awarded Fraser $1.5 million in salary and $24.5 million in stock-based incentives and cash incentives awards. The increase in pay comes after she initiated what's billed as the largest reworking of Citigroup in decades to make the firm more competitive. Last month, the bank said it would cut 20,000 rolls in its bid to boost returns. Bloomberg has learned India's market regulator found a hole of about $241 million in the accounts of Z Entertainment. Sources say the amount is some 10 times more than initially estimated by SEBI investigators. The issue is a blow to Z less than a month after its merger with Sony's local unit collapsed. China's two main stock exchanges have frozen the accounts of a major quantitative hedge fund for three days. That's after Ningbo Lindren Investment Management Partnership dumped $360 million of shares within a minute on Monday. The Shenzhen exchange says the move disrupted normal trading order. The ban is the latest move by Chinese regulators to reverse a slump in stocks that is now entering a fourth year. Plenty more to come on Daybreak Australia. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.
we are just about half an hour into the start of trading here in Australia. We're just getting some data crossing the Bloomberg. This is the Westpac leading index, a month on month number for January, seeing a little bit of a decline, but uh, still holding uh, pretty close to unchanged, to be honest, coming in at 97.03 uh, there with the six month annualized growth, seeing a decline of uh, about a quarter of 1%. We're seeing a little bit of weakness when it comes to uh, dwelling approvals, a little bit of weakness when it comes to the commodities uh, in an industrial product side of things as well. But let's take a look at how this is feeding through to the broad picture. A pretty muted trading because Asian stocks really kind of set to follow what we saw in the US trading session. Traders really weighing big tech prospects, all of all of which almost entirely is based on what we see out of NVIDIA's highly anticipated earnings. Uh, that really dragged Wall Street away from all-time highs and that is a picture. We're seeing Aussie stocks off by about uh, four tenths of a percent. Uh, flat trading session there in New Zealand and Singapore Nikkei futures signaling a little bit of weakness as we see Japanese stocks in the previous session falling with of course that December 1989 uh, record high still in sight. We saw quite a bit of weakness across Japanese insurers in particular, the worst performing sub index uh, that we saw on the topics. Uh, and speaking of the topics, there is sort of some uh, parts of this market suggesting that perhaps as we await for the Nikkei to hit that record high, uh, that some of the value names on the topics may actually start to outperform uh, even more so than the Nikkei from this point, despite being the less loved part of those Japanese markets. But so much of this, uh, Paul, really remains on what we get from NVIDIA. And of course, that's going to play into a lot of those AI chip names that are trading in Japan. Yes, yeah, some of those tech names going to be in focus as uh, Japan's Nikkei closes in on that record. And our next guest remains very bullish on Japan. A 55,000 target on the Nikkei 225 by the end of 2025. Joining us now is Jesper Cole, expert director at Munex Group. I mean, yes, but we're watching this uh, 1989 record of 38,915. You see the Nikkei blowing through that. Uh, where do you expect to see the biggest gains? Look, I think that uh, it's going to be pretty broad based. Um, the Japanese market is not like the US. It's not the Magnificent Seven. Uh, it really is the benefits of really a decade long restructuring, uh, lowering break even points, um, you know, having superb operational efficiency. That's what's going to drive Japanese um, visibility of earnings continue to grow. And as a result of that, you know, earnings growing 30, 35 over the next couple of years. Therefore, the Nikkei going uh, above 50,000 uh, towards 55,000 is not an absurd forecast. Well, we are, of course, watching the Bank of Japan for a potential tightening or at least a normalization of rates. But can you see a scenario where tightening could actually end up stimulating the Japanese economy, especially for households that have a lot of cash saved up? No, you, you put your finger on the pulse here. Um, you know, the Bank of Japan getting away from zero interest rates, which has been with us for almost one generation, and nudging rates higher to begin to normalize liquidity in the front end of the market. That's a positive, number one, for the banks, number two, for the Japanese insurance companies, and last but not least, Mr. and Mrs. Watanabe is also going to benefit because finally those deposits, um, you know, uh, are going to earn some interest. Yes, but there is a bit of scurrying up to do to think about record highs in Japanese markets, a continuation of this rally when the economy has slipped into recession, right? Is it because of the sort of Warren Buffett style of trade that these Japanese companies that are in focus are making most of their money overseas? Um, Heidi, you make the important point. Number one, um, you know, the decoupling of the Japanese stock market from the Japanese economy will continue, will actually widen further. Just think about it. The economy now, 40 percent of Japanese live off their pension. They don't live off employment income. They live off the pension, which is a state pension. So that doesn't really benefit very much from the stock market going higher. But the key point is, you know, that corporate Japan has got the restructuring, has got the global footprint, and has got the eagerness to actually invest in new for-profit enterprises. Just look at Nippon Steel, uh, you know, buying U.S. Steel. This is the Japan that we want to see. We want to see a Japan that expands overseas where a young generation of CEOs is actually taking bold decisions to grow for future earnings. 
Yes, but how does the yen play into this? And, and of course, that feeds into, along with the recession risk, what we expect in terms of the timing from the Bank of Japan, right? Do you think policy change and the impact on how the yen trades is going to have a meaningful impact on how Japanese equities trade? Look, uh, the arithmetic and, uh, you know, the econometrics is very simple. For every 10 yen of yen weakness, you're adding a windfall of 8% to Japanese corporate profits because the overseas gearing is just so very high here in Japan. So, yes, the exchange rate does matter, which is why I personally am more focused on the domestic plays here in Japan. That starts with the banks. It goes into the real estate companies. It goes into anything that looks and focuses and makes money from the Japanese domestic consumer here recovering. So focus on the domestic Japan rather than the export Japan. We are, of course, uh, waiting, as uh, Heidi mentioned, uh, on NVIDIA results and the, the whole uh, idea of advanced chips, artificial intelligence, a key theme at the moment. And we've got Japan uh, spending big in this space. Uh, which companies look like a buy to you? Um, it's interesting, right? I think, you know, when you look at a company like NEC, for example, right, when you look at even a company like Fujitsu, and very, very important, one of my favorite stock picks in Japan is NTT, the telecommunications giants, pays a huge dividend and it's got a new CEO and really is going to be a huge backbone beneficiary of the AI revolution. Yes, but always great to chat with you. Yes, Cole, expert director at Monax Group, as we continue to watch for uh, that December 1989 record high insight for the Nikkei. We are seeing a bit of softness though across broader Asian markets. And you can uh, watch us live and catch up on our past interviews with our interactive TV function. That's at TV Go. You can also dive into any of the securities and the Bloomberg functions we talk about. Join in on the conversation as well. You can send us instant messages during our shows. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Do check it out at TVGo. As we've been discussing, it's probably the most highly anticipated earnings report this week. NVIDIA going to be posting results on Wednesday after the bell in the U.S. It's been the S&P 500's top performing stock so far this year as it rides the AI frenzy and it's now the third most valuable company in the U.S. Nearly $200 billion in market value are at stake as investors see if one of the biggest stock run-ups in history was justified. Options markets are implying a 10.6% move in the stock price on the session following its earnings release. That could result in one of the largest single session swings on record. Well, Japan is embarking on its most ambitious chip development program to date and it's looking to leverage U.S. concerns over supply chain security and return to a game that it once dominated. In Shitose Hokkaido, the foundations are being laid for the revival of an industry Japan once dominated. In three years' time, it's intended there will be an advanced chip-making foundry on this site, producing cutting-edge two nanometer chips. Currently, advanced chip manufacturers concentrated in a handful of countries. There are geopolitical, economic, security factors involved. To survive as a nation, Japan needs to be a global main player with technology. We can clearly demonstrate that with semiconductors. As electric vehicles, AI and advanced weapons development spur demand, the U.S. is encouraging its allies to shore up supply chains and limit the risk of over-reliance on China. Because of the geopolitical risk between China and Taiwan, we are not expanding in mainland China. We are building a large factory in Thailand. Also, our presence in Germany and Japan is increasing. Taiwanese circuit board maker Unimicron has been operating here for some time. And now, with government-backed Rapidus setting up, the longer-term vision is to build Hokkaido's version of Silicon Valley. Further south than Kumamoto, the world's largest chipmaker TSMC has a $7 billion factory gearing up for production and another one in the pipeline. The Japanese government is pouring $28 billion into its chip revival strategy, with the city of Chitose experiencing a property boom as a result. Companies and manufacturers have been moving overseas, and now we are beginning to see a trend towards a return to Japan. I believe Rapidus is exactly the kind of business development that will give young people the opportunity to make different choices in their hometowns.
At the moment, Japan has a shortage of skilled ship industry workers to move in once the construction crews move out. The hope is build it and they will come. Paul Allen, Bloomberg. Well, one of those firms in Japan eyeing a slice of the chip-making pie is homegrown venture Rapidus is looking to mass-produce state-of-the-art 2 nanometer logic chips in 2027 from a starting point of zero. For more, Bloomberg Intelligence uh, Japan technology analyst Masahiro Wakasugi joins us now from Tokyo. And Masahiro, what's the biggest challenge for them to be able to get to this ambitious goal? Uh, yes, uh, regarding Rapidus, uh, they uh, should have a bit more experience and uh, actually they don't have experience and uh, if we look at, uh, for example, Samsung or Intel, they have uh, extensive uh, experience, uh, but uh, uh, for example, Samsung uh, suffered from the low production yield uh, and uh, probably made a loss last year for the foundry business, even though they have uh, extensive experience. And uh, probably one reason why Samsung had a difficulty is that uh, they went into uh, three nanometer technology as well as new transistor te uh, technology technology, it's called uh, gate all around. And uh, Rapidus at this time trying to do the, pr probably the pretty similar things uh, without the experience. So that should be the uh, biggest challenge uh, for uh, Rapidus at this point. Hmm. So what's uh, going to be required for Rapidus to not just succeed in two nanometer development, but, but survive as well? Yes, uh, regarding Rapidus, probably uh, we might have to be a bit patient and uh, uh, maybe time or money would be necessary. Uh, at the initial stage, uh, Rapidus should be facing the low production yield as well, so uh, they make some losses. And uh, in that case, uh, uh, maybe a Japan, Japanese government may have to keep funding uh, Rapidus, and uh, then uh, it probably, you know, uh, Rapidus can take some time and uh, to build a new technology. May, it may take maybe, you know, uh, a few or more years, but uh, as time goes by, Rapidus will be able to establish some experience and uh, will migrate to the two nanometer technology. And once they can get to the, you know, point, uh, it might be easier for them to further advance to the, say, you know, 1.4, 1 nanometer technology after that. So probably time and money would be necessary necessary for Rapidus. Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst Masahiro Wakasugi there joining us and uh, taking a look at some of the political headlines that we're tracking this morning. Analysts from Nomura and Barclays expect the Bank of Thailand to resist any calls for any off-cycle easing to support the economy. That's despite growing political pressure. Thai Prime Minister Shreta Thavitsen has called on the central bank to hold an unscheduled meeting to cut rates. Says the data indicates that the nation's economy is in crisis. The BOT's rate-setting panel isn't scheduled to hold its regular meeting until April 10th. A Pakistani political party controlled by Bhutto Zadari says it will join a coalition led by Shabazz Sharif in a bid to form a new government. The move follows talks to keep rival Imran Khan out of power. The new administration will have to shore up the economy and negotiate a new loan with the IMF after the current program expires in April. More ahead here on Daybreak Australia, this is Bloomberg. To the Lion City now, where the Singapore Air Show continues this Wednesday. The exhibition showcasing a shifting competitive environment for aerospace and defence. Some firms warning of supply chain challenges ahead. Bloomberg's Avril Hong is at the event and joins us now. So, Avril, what are we hearing from these companies? Yeah, guys, it's the second day of the event in the Lion City. It is back in full force this year. But based on the conversations in the past day, you really get the sense that supply issues continue to dog the aviation industry. Airlines still face pilot shortages. Airbus saying that carriers are expressing interest in loan pilot operations. This might not be something that passengers will necessarily welcome with open arms, but it could go some way in helping airlines 
plans to reduce their backup staffing needs. We also see jet shortages and that could mean increasingly that airlines are turning to China's COMAC as a possible alternative. We are hearing the strongest or one of the strongest endorsements yet for the Chinese jet maker. The Riyadh Air CEO saying not to underestimate COMAC. It could be a force to reckon with. And then as we see these supply gaps, airlines have really been struggling to fill demand. That has meant that some flight routes have just not returned and cities have just dropped off the international flight network. It is the supply dynamic. That's the backdrop against which the conversations at the air show are taking place on. Well, Avril, you've got some more big interviews lined up today. What's coming up? Absolutely. We're going to be talking all things aviation, including on flying taxis. Germany's Lilium has big plans for the Philippines. Speaking of, we are also going to be talking to the chief of Cebu Pacific to find out about growth plans and what this means for potential jet orders. We're not just talking about commercial aviation. We're also going to be talking about business jets with Daso Aviation, not just because we're tracking the flight path of Taylor Swift as well as Elon Musk, but because we want to find out where demand is headed as the pandemic-induced boom fades. And speaking of supply gaps, one glaringly obvious one is in sustainable fuels. We'll be talking to Honeywell to find out how their technologies can help to plug that gap. From Berg's Avril Hong there at the Singapore Air Show. So we'll be back for some of those conversations throughout the course of the day. In the meantime, let's take a look uh, across energy markets. This is how we're tracking when it comes to WTI at the moment. New York crude uh, trading just over $77 a barrel, a little bit of positivity, but pretty steady trading, really. These signs of a tightening market vying still with these concerns over lackluster demand. The Chinese demand picture continues to weaken, uh, all kind of creating a whole lot of uncertainty, Paul, as to how global global crude balances are shaping up. That push and pull when it comes to uh, supply and demand continues for energy. We just got a bit of breaking news on the Bloomberg terminal here out of Japan and it is trade numbers for the month of January. Uh, we've got exports uh, rising 11.9%. That's a bit better than expected. The expectation was for an increase of 9.5%. Imports meanwhile contracting uh, by 96 as well. And of course Japan, a very uh, oil dependent economy as well. So. Uh, uh, the trade balance uh, adjusted 235.3 billion yen. That is a surplus, and uh, we were expecting a, a trade deficit. So uh, a big beat there for Japan's trade numbers for the month of January. And we've got the yen uh, right now just hovering below 150. Let's take a look at how we're tracking on markets. Meanwhile, uh, here in Australia, we have the ASX uh, a little bit softer at the moment, off by about four tenths of 1% right now. We are watching a number of companies uh, out with earnings today, including the oil producer Santos. We had a full year profit miss there. A little bit later on, we're going to get the uh, big iron ore miner Rio Tinto reporting. That'll be after the bell uh, coming out of London. National Australia Bank was out with a trading update too. And uh, the Woolworth CEO, Brad Banducci, is retired as well. OK, let's take a look at how we're doing in New Zealand. The market there flat. Nikkei Futures, meanwhile, suggesting that, no, we're probably not going to take out that record today, the 1989 record being 38,915. But looks like we're going to have another down day on the Nikkei. E-mini S&P futures, meanwhile, are looking kind of flat at the moment, Heidi. Yeah, take a look at some of those movers. And you mentioned Woolworths, of course, and it's been a challenging week. Uh, reputationally for the Woolworths CEO, who has just announced his retirement, uh, the head of loyalty and memberships will be uh, taking over as uh, the CEO as uh, we see that leadership change after uh, really what has been a, you know, a viral clip uh, that we've seen all across across the various platforms after his interview in domestic media. This is a picture when it comes to some of the other stocks that we're watching. Santos, the full year net income missing estimates, but the company's saying they're exploring options to unlock value. We've seen profits slump over 40%, but the chairman's saying that the oil and gas giant, uh, despite last month ending those deal talks with the larger rival Woodside, looking for ways to attract interest in his portfolio on the back of those full year earnings slumping uh, as a result of lower prices. Also watching national 
National Australia Bank there as well. The CEO sees ongoing resilience in the economy, uh, saying that most of NAB's clients are coping with the challenges as well. An order to cash profit for the first quarter of 1.2 billion US dollars with a credit impairment of 193 uh, million Aussie dollars. Some of those higher rears in Aussie home lending and business lending volume growth as well, weighing as well. So uh, we are seeing a little bit of upside there when it comes to trading in the Australian lender. ExxonMobil has pledged not to curtail exploration or production plans in Guyana as Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro continues to ramp up his territorial claims in the region. Upstream President Liam Malone spoke with Bloomberg TV. We've been very clear. We're, we're staying very focused on executing our operations within our defined contract area. That's what we've been doing. That's what we intend to continue to do. And, you know, as, as we talked about, this development has many years ahead of it and we're not going anywhere. So, you know, fundamentally, we're, we're delivering and we're developing and we're continuing to spread the benefits to Ghana within our area of operations. You know, the matter for discussion with the borders is, is really a government matter, of course. You know, we take the, uh, the necessary precautions from an operational perspective, uh, you know, to the extent we can. But, but fundamentally, our focus on, is on doing what we say we're going to do, doing that within our approved contract area and continuing to do that. And that's uh, the reason why we're talking about this is because Venezuela's president was talking about barring you from exploring certain wa waters in particular uh, that it was talking about uh, near Guyana, right off the coast, that it claims as its own. Are you planning on exploring those areas? Is this a, a point of contention that you're talking to the State Department or is that not in your purview and you can continue with the production that you have planned without that? Yeah, the, 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 those, those, well, those wells that got discussed are in, are in our contract area. And we do plan on proceeding with them here in the, in the coming years. But are you concerned about Guyana's ability to defend itself? It's not just the rhetoric from Nicolas Maduro. It's the fact that we have seen in satellite imagery him building up his own military on the border. You, you know, I, again, it, uh, that, that's honestly a matter for, for, for the governments. Uh, clearly, you know, given the nature of our operations, we're, we're informed as to, as to the nature of those discussions. We've been pleased with the discussions. We're very supportive of Ghana's position that this should be resolved through the ICJ process and we'll continue to stay engaged with them. That is the Exxon Mobile upstream president, Liam Mellon there. We've got the market opens in Seoul and Tokyo coming up next. Uh, looks like we're probably not going to take out that record on the Nikkei today, though, does it? <laughs> no, looking pretty muted across the region. And uh, in the names of one, in the words of one analyst, I should say, we've got, what, almost 800 companies reporting this week. There's only one that really matters for the market at the moment. NVIDIA is the one we're watching to give us some indication of where this AI-driven rally might head next. This is Bloomberg.